Greetings and welcome to Archeo Thoughts Talks. I'm your host, Bill Ochter. Today, we will not be discussing the pandemic, but rather a different kind of infection that sits at the root of many of our institutions, including archeology, span structural racism, specifically how this affects BIPOC, which is Black Indigenous People of Color, uh, for the United States and BAM, Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic for the United Kingdom. Uh, students, academics, and professionals today. My ghost, am ah, not my ghost, my guest this week is Dr. Michael Rivera. Dr. R Dr. Rivera is a Filipino Chinese archaeologist, anthropologist, and podcaster, more importantly. Uh, he is a graduate of the University of Cambridge and the host of the Arc and Anth podcast. Welcome, Dr. Rivera. Rivera. Hi there. Hi there. Welcome back. You're, Hi, Bill. You're my first returning guest to the show, so welcome back. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it feels good to be here. So I was thinking uh, this is like uh, taking a big chunk of a big topic, and we've sort of been talking mm -hmm. about this for a while. We actually think we were talking about this a little bit when you were last on, um, on here. And so I think it's kind of best to sort of like – um, begin with some of the personal uh, on something like this. Um, you know, for full disclosure, we all interact with. So when, when we talk about like structural racism and how that works in our society, that affects everybody. Um, so if you're not talking about how this affects you first, you're not really talking about the issue at hand. Um, mm -hmm. Like me, for instance, um, growing up in the United States uh, outside of Washington, D.C. Um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, I, I sort of was, uh, worked in a liminal space. Um, my mother is of, uh, of, of Hispanic Mexican descent. Uh, but at that time in, in this area, there was not a large, uh, Hispanic population, which anybody who knows the DC area now would be shocked to hear that. So I was able to Passing's the wrong word because passing's a loaded word in the United States dealing with uh, with uh, different ethnic groups. Um, but I did kind of float in those spaces where sometimes I would be treated white with, and, and there would be no question about it, you know, treated white up to the point that you became an insider on the ethnic jokes against other people, mm -hmm. including against mm -hmm. Hispanics. That's always a good one. And then there were times when you were made to feel very much Hispanic and it was called out and you felt it to your core and you felt that helplessness um, when that, that mm -hmm. comes with being called out um, in, in a racist situation. And that's not just mm -hmm. growing up. That also included, you know, my academic work um, and my mm -hmm. professional work as an archaeologist. Um, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, I, there have been a few times where uh, my ethnicity has felt very, very present. Um, in there, and that's an invisible burden um, that you that you carry. Um, in addition to mm -hmm. all the other burdens in life, and you know, we all carry burdens of one sort or another. So this is not uh, a pity a pity award of who carries the most burdens, uh, but just a recognition mm -hmm. of the idea that we do carry we do carry different kinds of burdens out there. So mm -hmm. basically, we're setting the framework right now for which the rest of this discussion will go on. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Michael, you have any anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I think I agree with you that like um, that everybody has their own personal journey to uh, becoming conscious of the way that um, racism manifests in our society and it can affect us uh, from all directions um, towards us. We can be the ones who say something something uh, hurtful to someone else and uh, it can also happen around us and uh, then we have the choice as to whether to engage in that conversation uh, or, or not um, and yeah just to explain my my positionality as well I always think that's very important when we talk about these things uh, I grew up in Hong Kong I was um, uh, you know, my mom is a Hong Kong Chinese person and my, my father is a Filipino person. Um, even within Hong Kong, there is a lot of anti-Filipino racism on the part of Hong Kong Chinese people. Um, and uh, you might think also that uh, there are some Hong Kong people who 
you know, would, would consider themselves like, you know, Chinese in the sense that they belong also to um, the, the, the country of China and they are uh, part of the same ethnic group as the mainland of China. There is also a lot of like anti-mainlander rhetoric, especially these days because of political tensions. Um, and so it's just really <laughs> complicated. But um, uh, I think like I didn't really notice anything was happening to me until I grew up as well. And uh, <laughs> it's only since I've come to the, the UK or Europe to work in the last 10 or 11 years that I realize um, that I woke up, let's say, to uh, colonial history, to uh, issues of racism or discrimination, other forms of prejudice that, that exist as well, the other isms, and also, honestly, woke up to my own ignorance about it. And um, but that has a lot to do also with education and, uh, you know, when you're younger, when you go to, you know, primary school or secondary school, how history is framed and how society is framed for you by your parents and by your schools. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's sort of where I'm coming in from. Yeah, I would I would very much say that uh, my uh, sort of undergraduate uh, anthropological uh, background uh, sort of brought that awareness in there, uh, awareness of race, awareness of ethnicity, the complications of the history, sort of the the structural aspects of it, especially. Um, and we're not going we're not going to get that into into this episode. We'll probably do a separate episode down the road um, where we're actually going to talk about the historical structural aspects. Um, basically, like here in the Americas, it basically begins with 1492 and the enslavement of the Tenio. Uh, and then doesn't stop, hasn't stopped. Um, Europe is a little bit more complicated and we can go into that one as well. Um, but that'll be for a separate episode. Today we're talking about those who are dealing with the effects of that today. Um, it's sort of backwards, but um, there's been a lot with, with, with the pandemic. So I guess the pandemic does come into play. Uh, because with the pandemic, a lot of people have resorted to social media to sort of like communicate, touch, get in touch with people, just sort of, you know, vent what they would normally do maybe at work or on campus or at a dig site or something like that. Um, so um, I've, you know, I think over the past two weeks, at least, if not more, there's been some tense conversations over the idea of uh, race and identity. Some of it has to do with museums, which is similar to the conversation I had with uh, Tristan Boyle a couple weeks ago uh, over the place of uh, repatriation and um, and things of that nature. Uh, but also the idea of whether or not and this is I mean, and this is where, I, you know, I asked, I asked you to come on for this because I'm not as familiar with Europe. And there seemed to be something very specific within the European context about whether or not non-Europeans had a place, or specifically non-British, uh, had a place mm -hmm. in uh, British archaeology. That conversation is a little different mm -hmm. here in the United States. Um, very different. We're, we're, uh, we're still very racist, but uh, it's a different conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, that, so that caught my attention. <laughs> I agree. That caught my attention mm -hmm. uh, with that. It's, it's similar to the uh, the turf argument with, with, with transgender rights. Um, the, it seems to be a more vocal conversation in the United Kingdom uh, than it is in the United States. And maybe I'm just not following the same people. Maybe I'm maybe I'm too much of an Anglophile. But all my uh, cultural reading mm -hmm. all comes from the United Kingdom or something. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that's true. And um, I noticed that like as soon as I arrived in the UK, in 2009 um, as a you know tiny little Asian kid uh, back in September 2009 when you know I traveled like all that way and um, honestly like throughout like the four years of my undergraduate degree I didn't really notice that um, <laughs> people don't respect me <laughs> just inherently because I'm different right. and um, uh, I if I could meet the person who who first moved uh, you know, 9,000 something kilometers, I wouldn't recognize him because uh, I was so alone back then and keeping to myself, um, not because I wanted to, but because I had no choice. And I would sit at the back of lectures or I wouldn't really share a lot um, of, of 
who I was or what I thought like in seminars I was just quite quiet and kept to myself and you know being one of the only um, uh, BIPOC anthropologists meant that I was quite isolated in my background experiences my perspectives on the subject and you know in our field the subject is the human past and, and what defines humanity how societies lived but sort of my perspectives on that um, and my reasons for why I wanted to enroll in this course and why I was interested in human human diversity is not it was just not really something that was welcomed I felt like uh, I think teachers and the other students alike didn't really know like they didn't really realize that they were excluding me they just it just sort of happened and this implicit bias kept me um, out and I was sort of like culture shocked into uh, this social situation and uh, it was really weird because like uh, back in Hong Kong when I went to high school I was so used to this international environment and I could fit in and looking like I do and thinking like I do was okay and I fit in more easily uh, over in the UK all of a sudden I was uh, the other and yeah just people weren't inclined to take a chance on me yeah I mean I, I see that uh, I can see that for a lot of students it's an intimidating um, if nothing else um, one thing that sort of needs to be understood if you're say if, if you're a white viewer and don't quite understand what we're talking about here um, especially in in the field of uh, anthropology and archaeology. Once you get into sort of the upper level classes, those people who are majoring in declaring uh, in those classes at most institutions, it's not true everywhere, um, depending where you're at, is you walk into a room which will be 80 to 90 percent white. And if you're not white, that's intimidating, especially if you haven't negotiated that type of space uh, for most of your life. And if you have negotiated that space for your time, most of your life, you're you're performing. It's a performance uh, at that aspect. So either way, it's it's hard to be natural uh, in an environment like that. Um, not saying it's impossible. Not saying that you can't succeed. It's just saying that there's another invisible layer, another invisible weight uh, that's that that's being added there. Um, so this mm -hmm. is the kind of weight that makes when somebody finishes their undergrad go, yeah, I'm not going to continue in this. I'm going to go do something else. And they might say, why? Well, I just didn't like it. And they'll move away. And they'll never mention it's because, you know, of the sort of explicit sort of feeling outsider uh, pressures. Mm -hmm. um, and these outside pressures are not going to be necessarily explicit. You know, you know, often when we talk about structural racism, the first rebuttal you get is I, and I am not racist. And, but the point is you don't matter. Um, the, the conversation isn't about you. When we talk about structural racism, we're talking about the entire system, the system of, for a university, a government, uh, nations, um, all those things. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. It's not the individuals in charge. The individuals uh, involved may have the best intentions in the world, uh, but if you're within us in a, uh, we would definitely call it here in the white in the United States a white supremacist system, it doesn't mean that all the white people are are, are guilty of, of being vic uh, uh, in this. It's a it's a system designed to keep whites on top in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we're talking about. So to go back yeah. to that student aspect, the same is true then for the graduate student um, who's in the mm -hmm. middle of their program. And they just maybe they're not getting support that, that other people are getting uh, from there. Maybe, you know, you're looking at an angle because this is true, whether you're in academics, in business, or anywhere else in life. For the most part, people don't like innovative people that they're 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 there's some most of the time they feel it's more trouble than they're worth follow the status quo follow the known it's easier for everybody you want to go mm -hmm. try to do something that is out of the norm um you're you're going to get resistance uh mm -hmm. and if you are by your very presence out of the norm 
um, you are causing resistance, uh, whether or not that person recognizes that or not. So, mm -hmm. so that's you know. So any any more like direct stories of like sort of the, either the undergrad or no, graduate school No, I mean like uh, just just uh, well you know it continued into graduate school. Like uh, when we would gather at the pub or uh, we would have dinner, there were very very few times that anyone. Uh, ever ask me anything about my life in Hong Kong or my background, my family, my cultural norms, um, what I watched when I was a kid on TV, um, how I grew up. Like, it was so normal to ignore where I come from. And it wasn't honestly until I finished my PhD that I felt like I could stop performing, you know, to borrow your word, and uh, to... Um, try to like honestly authentic be more authentic um, remember like the strength that my family gives me and um, all the you know vibrancy and color that coming from Hong Kong gives to to my perspectives on this field um, but at the time like it was really hurtful because uh, obviously we you know me and the people in my um, surroundings we all shared something in common which was the science that we did the the papers that we read, the the goals that we had like later on in life, but um, honestly, it's really hurtful to to realize that some people's idea of what that future is for them, it doesn't necessarily include black people, indigenous people, or people of color in their like cohorts or in their um, collaborations, uh, whether we are or not. Um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really is inconsequential to them. Uh, for me, it's like it's you know honestly like my life. <laughs> if you don't want to include people, uh, it is our lives that you are um, sort of ignoring. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like if you if you really want to be a good collaborator and a good mentor and a good colleague in our field, you you have to recognize that this discipline is uh, is is built on on uh, a lot of tradition that is um, intertwined with that colonial uh, project that happens and is still happening over the last 500 years. And uh, the way that academia is designed is is to only reward certain people indiscriminately. Uh, you know, <laughs> right. that, that, that's, that's just how it is. It's like the, the exclusion, the, the implicit biases that people have uh, continue even all the way until, uh, honestly, people become tenured. Uh, it doesn't matter how big a name you are, you will always be uh, counted as lesser than as long as you are different in some way. Um, yeah, there were there were uh, there were also more explicit things as well. Yeah. Like uh, I remember uh, being called short round, for example. And for anyone who doesn't know, um, uh, during a seminar, uh, I had to for a seminar I had to work with two other people for this project. And these two English boys, they started to call me short round, which is the Shanghainese character in Indiana Jones. Uh, and the Temple of Doom, who serves as sort of like an assistant to to Indy. And um, I don't know, like, I don't know why that was supposed to hurt me. Like, I didn't know that that was supposed to hurt me at the time, because honestly, like, I hadn't watched Indiana Jones that often. And I don't, I don't remember all the character names or the plot. But um, I'm older now, and it wasn't until like in grad school I thought back to that time in undergrad when they used to call me that, and I was sort of like retroactively sad <laughs> right. for my younger self, right? It's for not even realizing that these people were like um, they're trying to infantilize were, you, you know, stereoty yeah, they were stereoty stereotyping me, and um, I don't even know, like weirdly subjugating me in an yeah. undergrad project. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an attempt at infantilization because it's it's meant to be he's a younger boy, mm -hmm. you know, so you're, you're less than type of thing. I I follow the uh, the Indiana Jones meme up uh, subreddit because every once in a while they have some uh, uh, some interesting and fun memes on there. But recently, mm -hmm. thanks to the, uh, the thanks to the pandemic and the racism associated with the pandemic, uh, they've been using a lot of uh, uh, imagery from Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. Um, to sort of uh, make jokes about spreading COVID-19. Uh, oh, it's explicitly, you know, implying that, you know, it was, you know, an intentional delivery device by the uh, Chinese, that rumor that's going around. 
not rumor. It's a mm-hmm. it's a it's a false tale that's being spread around of some sort of deliberate action, um, mm-hmm. as opposed to a pandemic, uh, which it was, which is what this is. Um, and to go to your other points, um, this is like something that's very seen. If you've ever been to an archaeological conference, uh, and you go to panels, and they're presenting papers. Um, mm-hmm. I've been, and I presented because my um, my focus in, uh, in my master's program was on uh, the antebellum, which is the period from 1815 to 1860 in the United States, basically between the War of 1812 and the start of the Civil War, um, and which is also the height of slavery in the United States. Uh, but I've been on many, uh, I've been on a few panels or and seen a lot more where all the participants on those there's there, there's very few to no black participants on any of these panels discussing slavery and the impact of slavery in the united states mm-hmm. and that is not mm-hmm. uncommon at all with uh, i was reading a blog from a couple of years ago from uh, dr bill white over at uh, berkeley um and he was sort of throwing out uh, statistics out basically any i think he was rounding these numbers about 95% of American archaeologists are white and about 99% of British archaeologists are white. Um, so yeah. when you have those numbers, it's not uh, surprising when the things like that happened. And it's, I mean, I've seen the call happen many a times and there's definitely progress um, regarding women um, in terms of like, if you see a bunch of white men on stage, well, you know, why aren't there women there? And there are definitely more than enough mm-hmm. women to put them up there, but it's uh, with with BIPOC, um, it's a twofold problem. It's they're being excluded, and there are not enough of them there. Um, this is that's why mm-hmm. we're sort of starting off with talking about like sort of the student level because it's losing all those undergrads who don't tell you the truth, or maybe don't even understand mm-hmm. the truth of why they're quitting. Yeah, um, which hurts the field. Um, yeah. Because I mean, they're... just like this last week, like uh, I heard from four students, like on the same day, almost like within 48 hours of each other. Um, and they were uh, in, honestly, like they were in Canada, they were in um, South Africa, they were in Australia, and they were in the UK. Um, and they were one of the only indigenous, Aboriginal or black students in their departments. And they were telling me about how they had to face a lot of microaggressions or sometimes outright racist remarks in their classes. And they would have to make a choice as to whether to speak up or, you know, maybe like not take on that labor and um, somehow, some way try to cope with it on their own. And it makes them feel like they don't want to continue in this field, like this field isn't welcoming to them. I think that that's a fair, and also what you said also when people go to conferences, uh, you can just see it. Uh, you can see that if, if entire panels and sessions are dominated by white people, then as long as you are like a Latinx or Asian or indigenous person, you, you're not going to see that this is a space for you. So why, why put yourself through that even more? Because, you know, it doesn't seem to look like it's improving and then you want to leave. And it's really sad. It's really sad that people quit for that reason. Yeah, because everyone's not doesn't want to or can't carry that emotional burden. It's a, it's an extra feat. There are people mm-hmm. I know plenty of them with the strength to sort of march right into the den of lions, proud chest mm-hmm. out, and be able to take on all comers and, and thrive in this field as a BIPOC, um, because you know. They just, you know, have that skill, desire, um, lack of, you know, history, uh, you know, uh, you know, what, whatever it, all those little X factors are in place. But that's not a norm. Um, that's not a norm mm-hmm. for anybody, period. Um, because like the situations you're talking about with the microaggressions, you either do nothing, which means you internalize it and that causes internal stresses. Um, which can be fueled to uh, me- on, you know, mental health issues. Um, 
Mm -hmm. or you confront it, which then you're then placing the burden. And this is always a, a problem uh, is it, sort of that, that tokenism. I have to explain mm -hmm. to you what it means to be what I am, period, all over the world. I, mm -hmm. I have to, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not the responsibility of the BIPOC person to explain their entire culture to you. You may be yeah. ignorant of their culture. That's fine. That's 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 an excuse once, but that other person is not responsible for educating you, especially yeah, if repeatedly. you're in this field. You again and again. <laughs> we're we're smart people in this field. We research. Go home and do your research. <laughs> if you don't yeah, know the, I answers. agree. I I actually agree, like very much with that because it's impossible for all of us to be born with that knowledge and that sensitivity to the experiences of everybody all at once. Um, but uh, I do consider, you know, if, if you are being told that you are um, perhaps insensitive or you have said something that is hurtful to someone else, if you respond with, um, if you reject that, basically, if you reject that critical uh, thinking, and, and that opportunity to have um, have a moment to reflect, then that does make you a bad person. And I don't need to like in all, in all my time online and uh, even face to face with people in um, academic spaces. I've never once uh, said to anybody that they are a racist. I have said that their behavior this one time in this way was you know, racially discriminatory or the thing that they have said is insensitive to a particular history. Um, I, I think it's not helpful to, you know, take that to mean that there's anything wrong with you. But, you know, when we when people uh, have their behavior pointed out to them, it's an opportunity, honestly, and it is a, a very generous opportunity to look at the comment that has been given to you and reflect on how Maybe you just were didn't weren't aware of something. Um, you're invited to to try and do better in the future. Right, and it's it's this is the kind of thing where it's once again it, 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 the same thing falls for the person who did that. They may not be in a position at that very moment to be mm -hmm. reflective. Um, they may mm -hmm. you know instinctively be defensive. Um, this this often happens when you're having these conversations. You call someone out for their explicitly say racially insensitive comment mm -hmm. unfortunately for a lot of people the first instinct is to become defensive and when that happens it's really hard to have a successful conversation uh, at that point and then it becomes about people and their hurt feelings and things like that um so mm -hmm. with that case then you know this the other person who made the offensive comment uh may need to go take time to reflect on their own uh, and, and and think about it. And that's, you know, it's hard. And these are the kind of subtleties which are very hard to do in 240 uh, characters. Like calling someone a, a racist on Twitter is very hard unless their profile picture is them sitting in the front seat of a, of a truck uh, and they're retweeting neo-Nazi propaganda all day. They're mm. probably a racist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but it is really difficult. Like, but if uh, you make a slip, a sort of uh, an insensitive remark, it, it may come from ignorance. It, it may come from you just don't know the words. Um, and I don't, I don't mean that as in like you, you don't know words and you're dumb. Like you have worked in a space where these words were okay, and now we're in a space where these words weren't okay. And I tr trust me, I know that throughout my life. Um, you know, there are things that I would have said in first grade or fourth grade or fifth grade that I would never say now. Uh, and mm -hmm. I could say them in front of my parents and in front of like, you know, people at church and in front of like other kids who were maybe some of the same races, different races. And mm -hmm. it would, it would have been normal at that time. Uh, but now yeah. it's not. And we just have to move along with that. And there's, you know, that's also a different problem of people not wanting to move, but that's that's a problem we all have to face. The future mm -hmm. is going forward. Uh, there is no going mm -hmm. back. Um, um, the... you, you mentioned uh, also that, you know, there, there seems to, there are some people who are, um, 
for people of color in our field who seem very uh, resistant and very um who seem very like strong quote unquote well, and, and yeah. they seem very cap capable of dealing with it when it right. comes their way and uh, i actually think a lot of people probably have that impression of me for example right. because i basically uh tweet a lot about this issue um I always uh, end my threads or, or end some commentary on my tweets um, when I've shown up on other podcasts with some sort of message of the solution or the the, the hopeful future that we could work towards. Um, the fact of the matter is that it takes a lot out of me. And I know that I always come across uh, typically on these things and on my, you know, over a hundred episodes of my podcast is very self-assured, very professional, very, um, you know, ready to take it on, like re ready to take all the haters and the trolls on, or even people in our field who mean well, but are actually doing something insensitive. Um, I'm, I'm even ready to educate them and have a conversation with them. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's honestly really mentally stressful. It is overwhelming. And what you don't see, um, because social media is, is curated and mine, you know, my, my, my shtick, I guess, is to make it look as authentic and everyday and as, as conversational as possible. But the reality, <laughs> the reality is that it's curated. Well, like it's, what you do is curated and what I do is curated. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, what it's, people it's, don't see is the stress. Well, it's a reminder that, that bravery is not about just blindly jumping into something without fear. Mm -hmm. It's going into a place with fear. Um, you know, the emotional baggage is still there, but bravery is being able to walk in there with it. Uh, so I would, I would still consider what you do uh, a brave act because you know yeah. what you're walking into, <laughs> you. you know what it's going to do mm -hmm. to you, but you go into there anyway. Um, I see we have our yeah. first question from a stemaholic. Um, okay, I have to point out that archaeologists have to learn about cultures through history. You think there would be less resistance to get to know present ones that is that is definitely a, a, at first glance a very hip you know seems to be a very hypocritical uh type of thing uh since we are we are mm -hmm. students of the past uh we are we study the peoples and cultures of the past um why do we still have these troubles with each other uh nowadays mm -hmm. and part of it is because we're in i would think is because we currently are in the nowadays we're still in the um, superstructure of uh, late stage capitalism uh, and mm -hmm. everything that goes with it, including structural racism. Uh, and mm -hmm. just because you're aware of the box you're trapped in doesn't mean you can necessarily escape that box. Um, that's the, sort of the yeah. flip it, easier answer to it. Um, I think also another one would be is there's, there's a certain cognitive dissonance. The past can't talk to me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, despite the post-processualist, and I trust me, I love my post-processualist stuff. I eat it up all the time. Um, an artifact doesn't speak to you. An artifact can help you give a guide, uh, a context of a place and a people. But other than their written documentation, which very well may be a lie, you always have to remember that part. Mm -hmm. um, they're not talking to you. Um, so you have a certain power as the person of today. And it's also a reminder that when we look at the past, we're not really interpreting the past per se. We are talking about mm -hmm. today using the past. So we are people today making statements about a perceived past uh, at the time, which is why if you go through and read reports written at different stages of the 20th century, they tend to all sound different mm -hmm. and sound almost more reflective mm -hmm. of the era they're in than than necessarily the era they're speaking about so can i pick up on that yeah, and yeah, uh, talk let's talk about one more one more myth there's also a myth that um in in archaeology that the old guard will die or they will move mm -hmm. on and then the new people in our field are going to take over and change everything and honestly though in my experience there are people who are young they are junior researchers they are junior archaeologists working in commercial and they discriminate just as much as the senior ones do. And they push bigoted ideas in the, in, the, in the formal or informal spaces right now, even though 
they haven't been working in, in the in the field that long because there is a self-selection process where people who who ignore colonial history or they ignore diversity and equity issues they are very good at hiring younger people who will have the similar inclinations to ignore uh, these topics basically or, or these uh, fights uh, and so I don't believe for example that there is an old guard that will die out and then will magically be fixed <laughs> no no <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't either they're I'm, really good at, at selecting people who have a similar mindset I'm, I, I'm old enough to remember when the baby boomers were the younglings and they were the rebels <laughs> and they were going to change the world and out with the old guard from the, with the World War II era and their old way of thinking I mean, it's the whole mm. Binford. We're throwing everything out the window. We're we're going to tear this place down. Um, yet somehow they look a lot, you know. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Um, mm. it, it's sort of a you know the replication factor is there, and, it, and that goes along the lines of like you know we we could question about whether or not. You know, once you know, for our, uh, for our other episode down the road on the history of uh, uh, how how we got to this place, uh, we could question whether or not it's even possible to do. <coughs> Sorry, that was a uh, peanut from earlier. Uh, if it's even possible <laughs> to do uh, archaeology, like archaeology with its colonial past, is it even possible to do? in ethical archaeology and that's a question for a different mm -hmm. time yeah <laughs> um i i i just am quite i i just never expected this you know uh when i was a, a young student earlier i just thought that i could come in and measure bones and uh do cool science and go on a few digs and I would never have to worry about this kind of thing. It was just not even in my universe when I was a teenager. Now yeah. I tweet about it every day. <laughs> <laughs> now, to be fair, um, mm -hmm. as someone here in the United States, the experience of an archaeologist is not too different than an experience of a BIPOC individual in nearly every other career field uh, in this country. Yeah. Uh, whether you're in the corporate world, whether you're in other aspects of academia, um, these t everything we've been talking about today uh, pops its ugly head uh, somewhere along the line. Um, mm -hmm. you're, so you're, you're in the professional stage, whether you're in the, in the academia or you're in the corporate world. Off, more often than not, if you're a BIPOC, um, there's a ceiling um, uh, for you. Um, mm -hmm. went near the very top. The top still seems to be, the gray hairs on top seem to still look the same. Uh, there might be a few more women. Uh, there might be one uh, BIPOC there, but for the most part, uh, they still look the same. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's a whole other aspect too for your more C. So I uh, don't. It's a weird. At some point, we're, we're going to get hopefulness at the end of this. Don't, don't worry. Uh, this is not all <laughs> doom and gloom. We're going to end this on a positive note because I'm realizing, man, this is getting dark. <laughs> but we're going to end this on a positive note. Trust me. Uh, and if you are a student, uh, please stay stay in this. Uh, we will tell you ways to navigate this this yeah. world uh, by by the end of this uh, sh uh, program because uh, there are ways mm -hmm. of navigating. Um, there are support systems and things like that. But it, it's hard. It, it's really hard. I, you know, um, you know, there's there, really there's the risk that, of the ceilings. There's this risk of sort of missing opportunities where you know there's the panels. You know, uh, whether once again, I, I I I believe, I believe that there was once that I uh, basically didn't get a researcher position simply because they thought that I wasn't brought up in the Western tradition like other candidates. And, um, you know, A, I'm really well versed in uh, all world, you know, like approaches to archaeology, indigenous, uh, Asian ones in particular, and also the Western tradition. And a lot of people in the Western tradition in archaeology are my heroes as well. <laughs> they were my supervisors and they were my mentors and people that I cite all the time. Like, I don't know what they were talking about, but um, 
but it's also besides jobs, as you say, invitations to take part in panels, conferences, workshops, to teach a lecture online, to be a, a visiting sp speaker, perhaps, like uh, at another university. We're not really looked at as viable options for people, and uh, that's not really good for like promoting promoting uh, you know BIPOC scholars. Um, and I, I often wonder like why that is like why is it that there are so few of us the, the further up you go in this academic pyramid and um, I think that you'll find like on social media when it comes to archaeology tweeting or outreach online you typically it's like from younger uh, up-and-coming bright minds or they're women they're disabled uh, scholars they're queer archaeologists and ethnic minority folks who are taking advantage of those spaces, right? And we put together a lot of blog posts, a lot of tweets, a lot of articles in popular uh, non-academic publications, a lot of podcasts, of course. Um, we give interviews on the radio. We work with communities very closely and, and interest groups. And you know, we share our entire life with people because I think a part of us also wants to show off what we do to those who are typically uh, marginalized and people who don't typically see themselves in this profession. Um, so like we deeply care about it and we spend all this time teaching and doing outreach and community building, but just because it doesn't follow in the traditional model of um, how people usually get, uh, uh, how usually, how people usually got recognized maybe 20 years ago, like producing papers <laughs> and giving lectures, you know, as the single lone genius at the front of the room. Um, all of that work that so many of us uh, diverse people are doing is less recognized and then therefore it makes us less likely to be hired in higher, higher positions in academia or in archaeology. Uh, that's a big, big factor that I always think about and, you know, I think that's like university systems really need to change the way that they hire as well and how they promote because all of that work is is very important and, and deserves recognition. I, I know in, in the States uh, a big factor that has definitely shaken up uh, the uh, the fields here is it's about bringing in grants, bringing in, bringing in money basically. Uh, can you bring mm -hmm. money and prestige uh, to the university? So your blog, your Twitter account, doesn't bring in revenue. They're looking for a revenue stream. Even public universities are looking for revenue streams. Uh, so mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways, professors have become business development officers uh, of archeology. span um, What can mm -hmm. we do in archeology span that's going to get us on the cover of magazines? And we'll do a partnership with this private corporation who's then going to donate X amount of dollars to the university and things like that. And those are the, th those are the types of, uh, you know, what we're going to work on this project in a very popular area where we can bring in a documentary mm -hmm. film crew in and things like that. Uh, those always still get priority over. I want to talk about these poor people on the outskirts of this major town whose work and contributions in the late 19th century helped to build that town. That's not as sexy. Um, those stories, the marginalized, even because even like when we talk about our people in the past, they, you know, the more famous people get more attention than the marginalized people. Um, even though mm -hmm. a lot of us archaeologists prefer to work on the marginalized people because they're the more interesting stories. And mm. also, if you're talking about historic archaeology, it's the stories that aren't told because we got books to tell us the stories of the famous people. But, you know, this sort of, you know, sharecropper, it's only going to be through his material culture that we're going to understand what mm -hmm. their story was. Um, mm -hmm. So so that's that's the, the sort of those two problems on there. Another sort of thing that kind of almost goes in a different direction because but this doesn't happen as often is you will see a bit of tokenism that takes place in some departments. Um, where you get the feeling that someone put pressure on somebody that they needed a BIPOC uh, member on staff. And so there they are. And they may not be getting mm -hmm. any support, but they're there. <laughs> so that everyone yep. can go, we got one. <sighs> Once again, this is not unique to the university system. Uh, private sector does this as well. 
and it's not unique just mm -hmm. to people of color this happens to women it's just as well um this sort of tokenism and it doesn't it's not any better than not being hired at all um because yeah. because they're not hiring you because you're skilled necessarily i mean you probably still are skilled uh, but first and foremost in their mind is that they needed a box to fill mm -hmm. and it's really like just uh sort of insensitive to the unique pressures that some of us have to deal with already uh even without people like almost um, sort of just forcing us almost or really compellingly trying to t like convince us that we need to represent them and make them look good as institutions or as companies. Um, like at least for me in my experience, like it was already quite a lot uh, that I had to deal with anyway, because it wasn't easy being like an international uh, graduate student. Um, other, there are a lot of other people who are like um, BIPOC researchers in the UK that I know or in the US that I know who have spoken about this before publicly but um, you know you have to check in all the time with the international office every term you have to pay extortionate <clears throat> tuition fees um, you have to work 10 times as hard just to get any recognition right uh, on top of what we've already spoken about which is facing racism or xenophobia on a daily basis in these spaces and then um, you know, then told, then told that we have to be grateful for the opportunity. You know, they have extended their hand to help us, uh, and therefore we should be grateful for the education that they're giving us, even though every day they are harming us or they are ignoring us um, and not giving us financial resources or giving us, uh, you know, mental health support. Um, yeah, it's terrible. And. You know, this sort of transitions to like what we what we're talking about here. The big the big picture, the bigger bigger picture is this. Mm. Um, that's 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 the structural racism of sort of everything, the box that we're all living in. Um, on that, uh, for most people, it's an invisible box because it's been normalized. It's just the way things are. Is it, an excuse you'll hear. What well, you know. As anthropologists, we're kind of taught, uh, but sometimes we forget, that we should be questioning why things are the way they are. That mm -hmm. you know we live in a in a uh, an environment with imagined systems. Uh, I'm thinking back to Benedict's imagined cultures, where you know our governments, our economies, these are imagined such structures. Um, they, they're not real you can't touch them there's, there's nothing to touch uh money money isn't <laughs> real except mm -hmm. it's real oh, actually it's almost wrong uh money is imagined but it is real um mm -hmm. the same goes for structural racism it's an imagined structure what what, what, what do we even mean when we talk about race it, it's an arbitrary selective topic um that may you know that that is convenient for that time and place like what is ra what is white in the United States? It's a it's a hodgepodge of a bunch of different Europeans who over time were allowed to fit into a category called race because it was it's, it has not mm -hmm. been consistent throughout the course of the American history. What constituted white um, since the mid 18th century when they started even thinking about the term? And of course, white in the United States doesn't really pop up until slavery does because you needed something to differentiate against slaves. And that's also what invents black uh, in the United States. Um, it was the mm -hmm. institution of slavery. So that's that's more of cut and dry. And that's, that's sort of my field on that. So UK, I don't quite know where whiteness comes from, but I do know that the United <laughs> Kingdom is uh, made up of a bunch of different European sects who have invaded or lived on those islands uh, for thousands of mm -hmm. years. Uh, so I don't mm -hmm. know what one lineage or, and I'm not going to get into that now because I don't know enough uh, on those things. Yeah. So, but whatever it is in the late, tw in the early 21st century, it's been normalized by Nigel Farage and his uh, ilk to mean mm -hmm. something of what a true British mm -hmm. person is. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and one of the consequences of that is that it, it sort of separates individuals w within their system. If people become boxed uh, at some point, you become 
the BIPOC, so you must stand over here. And you're white, so you go into this box over here. Um, and you're and basically now at this point, uh, you're commodified as well. Um, so you have certain value, you have for certain monetary values uh, within, within the system. So, so whiteness gives you sort of a slightly higher value than others. So that's where a sort of implicit, you know, if you're going to make a choice like going, I got white or I got a BIPC, I feel more comfortable with that pick over there. That's a value choice. Um, and then there are the invisible barriers, the ones you can't cross, like the, okay, uh, hmm. we're all going to go out for lunch right now. And then the three white folks get together and just walk out the door. And they didn't invite you. Yes. And they didn't think of, and it's not because they, it's not because they were intentionally leaving you out. They didn't think mm -hmm. about you. You, <laughs> you were not, yeah. a, you were not a thought uh, in their mind. Mm -hmm. um, and it also means when um, I've known people like, um, like second generation in the United States, like uh, who are, are sort of save an ethnic group. Uh, I, I, this one, uh, this person was a, uh, someone from Taiwan, Taiwanese descent. And they were in like in a, in a cafeteria setting and the, the Chinese person would come over and go and speak to them in Mandarin and go, you know, come over there. And like, well, it's like, why? Just because I'm the, I'm the, uh, I'm the person. I'm just sitting here enjoying my lunch. Uh, so it, it mm. kind of works, uh, you know, that sort of like bunching people start bunching themselves. Everyone plays the game. No one's excluded from the game. Uh, everybody mm -hmm. plays the game. Even BIPOCs play the game. Uh, even even mm -hmm. BIC, uh, POCs can be... I don't want to use tribal. I hate that word. That means something right. else. Uh, they can be very insular. They can be an insular group. That's, that's yeah, comes because the, the, this, the system encourages it, basically. Yeah. You know, it doesn't encourage us to... Just why don't you just ask each other um, point blank, like, and just respectfully ask each other what people's preferences are as to like when and how to go to lunch. Right. <laughs> um, uh, that kind of thing is just uh, sort of lost. Um, yeah. That resonates with me, though. I remember like, uh, I remember it was ki kind of weird to me uh, at first to see a lot of people um, just take breaks and then their break would be like an hour and then they would go like out to the shops or something and like take a whole hour off and for me it's just my personality right. and i'm not speaking for all hong kong people or all asian people do this just me personally um you know like my mom did things in a certain way so i did it in a certain way which is you have lunch at a certain hour and then you go back to work that's it it's nothing to do with my like Honestly, nothing to do with my culture. Uh, there are people who are more relaxed about that and other people who don't, um, or even more strict about it. But uh, yeah, I just wish like the, the system wouldn't encourage this sort of like grouping thing that like is so instinctual almost for lots of people. And people, once, you, once you've once um, you sort of gone down that path, like after two weeks in grad school, you're, you're kind of already trained into that kind of thinking and it's really really hard to like get rid of your bad habits unless someone unless everybody involved is like happy to talk about it and have a mature conversation about it to like change things up and change the culture okay we got an another question from uh, stem hawk thank you for the questions um have either mm. of you sought better aligned funding sources if so any success hmm um do you want to go first well mine's a little bit weird because i'm i'm in i'm a contract archaeologist uh so mm -hmm. it's more compliance archaeology so uh, my funding sources are to try to find clients who are willing to pay uh for the services of that and that's that's a little more cut and dry because that's business and business is about making money and there's so many mm -hmm. regulations regarding uh, minority businesses and things like that um, that there's you know there, there's a lot of encouragement of uh, financial encouragement uh, to uh, mm -hmm. to do these kind of things and maybe that's what's maybe needed in academia the kind of uh, things that's in the business world that makes business to business interactions go better mm -hmm. it's not necessarily within the business it doesn't always help 
but business to business interaction it, it kind of helps on that so it's yeah I, since i didn't go down the academic route um grant funding has not really been something i've uh i i've really been playing playing the game on other than in, in my master's mm. we did a couple mock uh proposals <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like in the UK, in the UK archaeology, um, in commercial archaeology, um, you know, if we're thinking about like how to actually solve these issues, uh, oftentimes it does require uh, human working hours to meet and discuss these things. Sometimes it takes training. Sometimes it takes someone with expertise to come in and to help you um, develop a more like uh, inclusive working culture, uh, even in an archaeological firm. And uh, I understand that some, like I've heard of two or three instances in the UK where an archaeology um, contract company will uh, actually devote resources to this. And so we'll ask the stakeholders um, if they would cover also maybe like a, you know, like a field work um, safety uh, thing you know in specifically to to keep women safe and to keep young archaeologists safe would they be willing to fund a workshop like that because you know i would argue that we're not doing the best job that we can in commercial or even in academia if we're not ensuring that all staff and students are protected from discrimination or like you know harassment or inequity yeah. um so there's a possibility like sometimes that there are good stakeholders out there who might be interested in putting in money for that, but it is very rare um, and it yeah. takes a, a, a certain number of people with the right mindset to like collaborate on that kind of thing. Yeah, and that's true for, yeah, like, uh, you know, reading enough uh, field school with their health and safety plans needing to include, you know, harassment policies. Mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. I, I know here in the United States, there have been uh, a, a few high profile uh, incidents over the past few years of staff abusing um, people, uh, you know, students or, or other staff members uh, within their field schools. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, trying to develop programs and systems uh, to ensure, you know, the safety of everybody who goes out there, everybody who goes on a field project should be safe, should not have to mm -hmm. fear uh, an assault by somebody within their crew or a boss. Uh, on that crew and mm. that's just that that should not go without saying but unfortunately in 2020 it still needs to be said um private firms it's i've seen that less so here only because companies we have to contract directly with like the developer which means they want to pay mm -hmm. the very minimum to get their permit uh they aren't yeah. interested i mean in, in giving us any extra money um, so that's mm -hmm. a, a downside to that. Uh, so there have been steps. I think so, so we have some of the national trade organizations which try to offer these kinds of trainings, but um, cool. it's, a, it's a firm by firm type of thing. Um, there is, uh, if you talk to, I think if you just talk to one woman archaeologist or at least two or three, you will understand that there is an entire uh, whisper, whisper book out there of who to work for and mm -hmm. who not to work for uh, based yeah. upon their creep factor. Um, and I'm sure the same is true in terms of like people who are discriminatory. Um, you yeah. can probably find out pretty quickly who's who's the racist crew chief and who's not the racist crew chief. Um, I can't keep track of it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's like, it's, it's funny, but it's also not funny at oh, all. It's the kind and, of thing um, you have to laugh to, to stop from crying. <laughs> Yeah, but like, uh, when it comes to a uh, major funding, like uh, at least in um, what I've seen in like biological anthropology or in bioarchaeology, um, quite oftentimes the people who are managing those funds, if they're a really old organization or foundation, they will have their roots in the 1890s or the 1920s or the 1940s when a lot of bad stuff <laughs> was happening. Um, and, uh, you know, the funds were initially created for um, eugenics purposes or colonial purposes, right? And um, the people who are in charge of them right now, they are also sometimes made up of teams of people who are not entirely like uh, 
okay like they're not into, they're they're problematic sometimes as well so i i really like sympathize with this uh with this person who's contributed the question because you don't want to get involved uh and especially be funded perhaps by by people that you you know don't, don't align with the values that you have um to offer like more like concrete advice i would say that in my experience of of trying to to you know, tread that line. Um, people who people who don't get it basically, and people who aren't really like willing to 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 listen to you or to understand the problems of the field, uh, they really do not deserve our time. They do not deserve our labor. You know, it's a distraction. This uh, sort of discrimination, as the great Toni Morrison once said, it keeps you from doing the work that you want to do. Um, and oftentimes when it comes to, you know, uh, where you can get funding, if you ask, if you ask someone in the field, in our field, where can you get find funding, certain things, certain names come up first. And those names quite typically in this uh, white dominant space will be organizations and funders who basically like aren't really prepared to fund projects by BIPOC people or that are, you know, projects that are done in a way that actually, um, you know, is, is respectful of indigenous communities or uh, respect it, respectful for hist to, towards history. And I, I feel like um, the way that those, those foundations, those names come up first of those various funds is very, very designed to, to make you think that it's not possible to find some, to find a funder that will align with you. And what I would encourage anyone out there to do is to actually like um, try and talk to people, uh, talk to other um, ethnic minorities and talk to queer people and disabled archeologists, talk to even, uh, talk to allies, you know, white allies. And um, because sometimes that can be really reaffirming uh, as long as there are people out there who are open to being creative about where you can get funding you'll find in that network opportunities for jobs, for funding, or just for, you know, basic support in your work. Because um, the ways that those fund, you know, the, the same few uh, funders keep coming up, all of that is designed to make you think that it's not possible to find an organization or a funder that aligns with uh, more radical, anarchist, more um, inclusive, uh, you know, principles or values. Yeah. Would you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. And I think, you know, you know, that sort of it brings in sort of the next sort of thing I was thinking of is like, so how do you find these, uh, these other other people to help you the BICOPs and the uh, mm -hmm. allies and everyone else? Uh, first step, yeah. I would say would be Twitter. Uh, there's a huge community out there. Um, on there. Uh, I would say that do you want to do you want to separate this into like um, people at different stages like what can students do what can like junior archaeologists do and then like what can the, the you know the big names do <laughs> because like if it's like upturning uh, you know uh, upturning and turning the tables uh, uh, you know students can't do that so like I think there needs to be like different levels to this. Yeah I mean I would, I would say it at, at first I mean they kind of can go to both depending um, like a lot of uh, national in the U.S. national archaeological associations have within them, um, like I know there's Society of Black Archaeology within the Society of Historic Archaeology, yeah. um, and I think there's also one for Asians and one for uh, Latinx as well. So those would be good resources, pretty much at any stage. Um, mm -hmm. You know they'll have information for students, and if you are, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're you're a professional at, at this point. There's also uh, resources there, and, and it's a support group. Uh, these are all professionals. Mm -hmm. um, so those those are probably your big institutional places to go to. Uh, there's a reason that that sort of these groups exist. Uh, there are going to be separate BIPOC institutes. I don't know how how many there are in the UK. And other and you and throughout Europe, but I know in the U.S. there there are rare they do exist. <laughs> okay, so mm. that would so that would be for U.S. folks. Uh, for U.K., we're still going to try to help you here because uh, we're not going to leave. We're not going to leave. I, I feel uh, I um there there are uh, networks that are being put together at this very moment. Um, aside from that, I know that the uh, in the U.K. at least for the charter uh, the charter 
uh, Chartered Institute for Archaeologists in the UK. They do have uh, an equality, diversity, and inclusion um, working group. And uh, I encourage everybody to like look that up if you're in the UK and need support because Laura Hampton, the um, officer in charge of that, is, is really, really good at supporting uh, anyone who is BAME over here. Um, I would like also like agree with you that like online is really good. <laughs> and, um, you know, when I was an undergrad and even when I was a PhD student, it was a little bit difficult sometimes to find people uh, in in person to, to actually better support each other. Um, but yeah, I would say like to anyone out there, if, if, if in particular you feel that you're not in a very powerful position at the moment, uh, latch on to allies who make you feel positively and try and establish your own community of support because no one can do this job alone. So, um, you know, it just, that then logically following on from that, you need your support uh, within academia or within commercial. Um, and the people who don't get it and especially aren't open to learning how to do better or talk about these things openly, they're not worth the time. And uh, they might they might be able to um, engage with you archaeologically in the work well and produce really nice reports and you can have a beer with them perhaps after work but there'll always come a point when i think that those principles um will, will come to a head and it's just not worth the time um if you sense even a little bit that they're not um you know open into listening to to your opinions and your experiences um so yeah sometimes building that community will take like different kinds of effort and at least for me, and I think for you too as, uh, as well, Bill, it involves a lot of online interaction through Twitter or through Instagram or Facebook or podcasting. Like it's not the same as in-person contact, but it helps just to have someone to text and to DM um, so that you don't feel silly for having a particular reaction or feelings towards something. And, uh, you know, at least speaking for myself, like I'm always happy to receive any messages from anyone uh, and if you want to reach out to me, very happy to to help give advice, uh, you know, if anyone wants to. Yeah, same here um, at Archeo Thoughts. Um, and, and that's and that's sort of the positive thing. I mean, and, and it's OK to be a lurker, um, you know, yeah. you, you want to follow and you don't want to participate at first because you're nervous or shy. That's mm -hmm. fine. Uh, watch the conversations. Uh, you should probably be doing that anyway. Uh, before you engage because you want to make sure that the the kind of conversations this this, this person or persons you're following um, mm -hmm. are the kind of conversations you want to be engaged with um, so that's yeah. that's that's an important aspect of it um, in person does help because in person helps you with your local community depends on what type of a, um, and it's an in-person support system sometimes you just need someone to sit and either have coffee or a beer with mm -hmm. and just kind of like vent and that's there's yeah. there's a you know it's very online cannot really really give you that satisfactory type of vent that just sitting down yeah. with another person can do uh but online uh, allows you to talk to people uh internationally and uh get i mean like uh perspectives yeah. <laughs> Uh, where where possible, like you know, I would really encourage anyone to like really try and find those like Latinx, uh, indigenous, black, Muslim, Asian, queer, disabled uh, allies out there. See if they'd be up for a Zoom chat or texting to talk about your experiences, even if you didn't broach the subject before. Um, as long as it's respectful, I think that um, at least in my experience, I've I've actually always been quite surprised by how open many people are to talking about it. Um, in a respectful way uh, and you know that includes you know a lot of white allies actually who have been really reaffirming for me and um, you know even though of course it, it can take a while to like suss out whether you how much you can trust someone um, you know just have your have, have be a little bit aware of what what you might uh, be wanting to talk about and how prepared someone else is to engage in those conversations, but um, yeah, I, I actually find a lot of the time that uh, surprisingly people are very, very, you know, open to talking about it, and, and people shouldn't be too afraid. But you're, you're right, though, that uh, if if people want to lurk, that's also really good. I actually see that as um, even if it's even even if it's one-sided, 
it's still like a private support system because like by reading other people's stuff at least for me like it helps me feel less alone right. and it helps me get motiv motivated to fight another day because someone else is also uh, fighting um to accept themselves and to be authentic to themselves be radical find solutions um feel hope like when a hater which there are some <laughs> uh, when a hater sends me a message i read a blog post by a student protester or i watch a lecture on youtube about indigenous community building and then i forget all about that hateful comment and it's like you know maybe it's just because like i'm an academic but like i, I find that reading about um the history of the discipline or reading like these perspectives really helps me to um you, you know just have a lot of joy in the field again <laughs> after like looking at something that is like quite unpleasant or going through something that that you know afterwards i need some support in their own quiet way all of these indigenous black and disabled and queer and anarchist and socialist uh you know ethnographers and ar archaeologists they are basically writing stuff that is outside of canon right and because it's it's um it's sort of like seeing how it's okay to have different ideas about like the human past or how we study the human past it it makes you it makes me feel better that i can have other thoughts as well that are not in in keeping with like traditional canon um so yeah like lurking is fine <laughs> and like consuming other people's content is is actually really uh, something i i deeply encourage now I, my sort of like final positive affirmation on all this mm -hmm. is no matter what stage or level you're at if your desire is to become an archaeologist don't let anyone take that away from you because you own it you are the one who's going to make sure you're an archaeologist if someone is throwing a roadblock find a different path if if this program isn't right for you find a different one or find mm -hmm. an avenue to make your voice heard to change it uh, you don't always have to leave um, sometimes it's because they've never been confronted with it uh, with their problems and once they're confronted they will they will change course um, but at every stage uh, because unfortunately this is going to be a lesson for life um, there will be roadblocks to your dreams in life uh, at every stage uh, whether it's you know buying a house moving to a different country your retirement plans um, it's the worst uh, economic disaster since the Great Depression all of a sudden you're in a pandemic and you've been fired challenges will be thrown at you from all directions uh, but just stay focused to what you want to do uh, and the one thing I do mm. I do love about this field um, after we've been spending the last hour dunking on it uh, but one of the things I do love about this field is everybody I know in this field is absolutely passionate about it um, because it is hard to become an archaeologist this is not business this is not you know some of the other uh, you know types of uh, industries out there where there's a there's a lot of like fortune and glory there's a certain social cachet mm -hmm. that goes with it but that lasts for about 30 seconds as soon as you tell them you never dug any gold uh, unless you're an egyptologist then you might have better stories for cocktail parties but you know if i'm <laughs> you know oh you're an archaeologist what do you do i was uh, digging up where that subdivision is across the street all of a sudden they go across the room but that doesn't bother me because i am passionate about my work I am passionate when I'm finding things in the field. I'm passionate about helping to uncover the past, or to help tell stories of people who don't have their stories told. Um, that's why I do mm -hmm. all this. So, so keep that in mind when you're when you're confronted with obstacles and things like that. That this is just another hurdle to overcome, and it will hurt. We're not telling you it's it's going to be easy to overcome these obstacles. We, we mentioned that earlier. 
uh, about sort of bravery. It's, it has nothing to do with not being afraid and not being emotionally hurt. It's about mm-hmm. doing it despite all that. And unfortunately, you're going to have to do that uh, at, at different times of life. Not all the time. Um, it should not be the norm. <laughs> uh, but sometimes you will. And if it's something you truly mm-hmm. believe in, and if you want to be an archaeologist, this especially goes out to the undergrads. I don't want you guys quitting. <laughs> Um, if this is something, Me if this is something you absolutely want to do, don't quit. Reach out to somebody mm-hmm. online. Reach out to somebody else. Reach out to an existing grad student who you might know mm-hmm. from on campus, because it is different. Your your experiences in undergrad versus grad school are light night and day. Um, so, so don't give up your dreams. That's basically what I'm saying. So that that's my sort of little mm-hmm. final pop final affirmation there at the end to say to turn positive at the end (laughs) yeah i have something to say to the people who uh have quote unquote already made it but might still be struggling with these issues yeah um i think that right now a lot of uh, diversity groups are made up of those working in our industry already but um they're sort of like taking part in these initiatives like as a side project of theirs or they're often volunteering right they're not really compensated for that and um you know often that's that's what contributes to it like not being really like good at good at good enough basically to actually like implement any real change because uh you know we need to be brave and and tell those in charge around us, or even if tell ourselves, if we're the ones in charge, that these issues cannot be something that we only examine at a meeting once every three months, or once we have a set of people in charge of diversity that, you know, the rest can can then concentrate on the real work. Like that is not about, about uh, improving this, this, uh, you know, reality. So, because I've, I've been in big group meetings where like diversity was one of the last topics to be talked about in a long string of like, you know, let's talk about the finances, let's talk about the membership, let's talk about the, you know, the new jobs, blah, 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 blah. And then diversity at the end when people are already like clamoring to like get out of the room <laughs> with all their notes packed up and stuff. Um, I have like deja vu, they're just even talking about it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if we really want the best uh, quality work that uh, interprets material remains of the human past that that interprets the spectrum of past human experience as accurately as possible then we need diverse people involved in these projects who will be able to offer various critical perspectives when evaluating that archaeological evidence so that means that like all of this inclusive and equitable practices need to be like imbued in every single project that we take on every step of what we do and it needs to be a big part of how like excavations and and research are designed um so that you know we can actually get the framing right from the very beginning uh instead of trying to like put a bandage on a wound uh that's already bleeding right so if if you actually get it at the core and you, you structure it around actually inclusive culture and there are many resources online that um you know i'm sure bill and i would be happy to like direct you to you know you're you're going to be able to actually uh, implement some change uh, slowly but but surely uh, even if there might be like resistance it needs to be prioritized in that way and um, i just want to give like a very quick shout out to like a lot of people um people of color and and also like really great allies who are actually trying to push this stuff so like uh you know raksha dave uh, dr justin dunavant ella al shamahi uh, Dr. Kisha Supinand, like there's so many people in the UK, in Europe, in the US, you know, I recognize everybody who speaks about these issues in their scholarship and online. And because uh, honestly, like they are paving the way for this change, even despite it being so difficult. Um, but yeah, I think it's important that uh, each of us tries to find the role that we can play and do it. So for me, like I'm a podcaster, I tweet a lot, I'm a science communicator, so I often talk about it and bring it up on my podcast, not to like shove identity politics into everything, but just to like encourage people. And I, I often ask like white archaeologists, um, for example, like what is what is the involvement of local local uh, contributors to the to the work? 
just so they can talk about it and share that as well. Um, so that our archaeology isn't done in such a colonial way. Um, just little things like that. That's my role. But I think that each, each and every one of us has a role to play. And um, we can just follow all those people who are already challenging the way that we think in our field uh, and challenging what is possible. Uh, yeah, just, you know, keep up the good work if you're already working on it. And, um, you know, know that you're not alone if you are, you know, just starting to get into this, uh, this, this fight, let's say, for more uh, equitable and, and inclusive archaeology. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Dr. Rivera, for joining me today. Uh, I think those are very thank strong. You, I think those are very strong words to sort of close on. Uh, we could go on for longer, but uh, we'll save. We're going to save <laughs> that for a different episode. And thank you for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can contact me at uh, Archaeothoughts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm everywhere. Uh, you could even email me mm -hmm. at Archaeothoughts at gmail.com. Do you want to give out any of your contact information? Um, you can find me on Twitter at Rivera Michael, on Instagram at Dr. Michael Rivera. Uh, you can add me on Facebook if you want, actually, uh, if you have any questions or feedback about this. The podcast that I do, the Arcananth podcast, is at Arcananth Pod on all of your social media channels. So, yeah, thanks. Hey, you, 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 you came on. You deserve the plug. <laughs> 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 so, if speaking of a plug, if you like uh, what I've been doing for the past now five weeks, uh, please consider becoming a pat patron at uh, www.patreon.com/archeothoughts. As little as one dollar uh, can help bring more and higher quality content to you. Uh, links to some of the topics we discussed will be in the show notes. Um, this show will be on YouTube on Friday, where we'll have better show notes and things like that. But please um, follow, like, share, and subscribe. I think that's everything you can do to help spread the word. Once again, Thank you, and in these times, be safe, stay inside. Goodbye. Bye.